So what's going to happen in November? I know many of you are worried. Uh, you're concerned. Uh, you're confused, particularly about how to tell the difference between polling and propaganda. And I have some with us today, somebody here with us who is going to dispel that confusion and assuage that fear. If you've been with this channel for some time now, you know that whenever I talk about polls, the latest polling, particularly leading up to a primary or a general election, virtually every single time there's a, uh, there's a living footnote, a source that I cite, and not just for the polls themselves, but about the whole ethos behind polling, the, the cyclical nature of it, the, the regional specificity of it. And I'm ecstatic to actually have this living footnote this reference here with us in living flesh today, and he's the one and only Rich Barris, a.k.a. the People's Pundit. I've been following Rich now for the last few years, and his analysis always blows my mind in terms of its precision, its accuracy, uh, and most especially, as we'll get into today, its art. And that's why I believe he is hands down the single best analyst out there. You got to subscribe to his YouTube channel. I'm a huge fan of his Inside the Numbers podcast. He's over all over social media. Uh, he has a locals page. He is my go-to guy for polling and polling analysis, the one and only Rich Barris. Rich, thank you so much for honoring us uh, with your presence. It's so awesome to have you here, man. Yeah, I'm, I'm really happy to be here. And, and thanks for that intro. I really appreciate it. It's good to be here. I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, you, you, are, you are what Nate Silver should want to be were he to ever grow up, but I don't see that happening. <laughs> He's got some handicaps going on that are preventing him from growth without there a doubt. There's something going on there. It's creepy. It's definitely creepy, but yeah, I love your insiders pro um, inside the numbers program. I love your interviews um, that you give, uh, the articles you post on your locals. And I have to say, I see you very much as a kind of polling virtuoso. And I mean that you blend so well both the art as well as the science in assessing public sentiment. And I'm wondering if we, we could start with that. It's just, it's fascinating to me how polling is both numerical, statistical, indexical. It's all, it's clearly a hard, there's a hard science to it, but I've, I've heard you mention often that like the real magic uh, to polling, the, the secret sauce, as it were, is more the artistic side of it. Can you draw that out for us a bit? Yeah, that's yeah, that, that's a great place to start. Uh, look, you know, there, there there's a long, you know, long held belief in saying that polling is part art and part science. And that's absolutely true. And just to give people an idea, if you gave uh, four different pollsters, uh, the same data set of raw results that were, you know, collected from polling in the field, from different methods, whatever it may be. And you gathered up that data set and you handed it off to four different pollsters, you'll get four different results. You know, somebody, uh, you know, like me would look at it and uh, maybe I have different weighting techniques or whatever it may be. Uh, but I'm looking at different things that are really meant to be red flags for me. I approach it a little bit different. I'm looking to see whether or not I see any red flags that don't make sense as, as opposed to, uh, you know, like for instance, you know, if, if you're polling a state that you know is, you know, 35% conservative and when you're done doing all of your weights, it's like 30%, then you know, maybe I did something wrong somewhere else. Maybe I don't have enough rural responses or, you know, it's another regional geographic issue. Uh, there is definitely an art to it. And I really think that you can't do the job. You cannot figure that out, uh, Steve, unless you know a little bit of something about America and how and, and the different people right. in America. Well, have you ever been to the state of Pennsylvania? You know, before, right. like if you're Nate Cohen from The New York Times and you have Biden leading in Western Pennsylvania, like Nate, have you ever been to Western right. Pennsylvania, you may have done something incorrect. So uh, there, and there's a lot more to it. You know, we're in a different world and there are a lot of people clinging to the old ways of polling. They're not innovative at all, but there's a, like anything else in any other industry, there's a boys club. 
and there's a there's a status quo and anyone who tries to change that boys club up or challenge it and challenge the way the boys club does things to change the status quo they they don't like it and uh it takes time you know for change uh but it and also they, and hinders. they ra and they raid you <laughs> they raid your house <laughs> yeah they kick your door in they <laughs> <laughs> they could, you know, we're laughing about it, but we're at the point now where uh, I, right. I told people, at, you know, at some point, Steve, that, you know, they would look at the New York Post and say, this story before an election is misinformation, we're going to lock right. you out of your account. Don't right. be surprised when they start looking at people like myself and Trafalgar and, uh, you know, our right. polling being differently. It doesn't matter how much more correct we've been, uh, that they'll they'll start to uh, come at us like that as well. It's It's getting to be a nasty game. It is. It is. Yeah. This is what happens yeah. when you politicize truth in effect, right? It's not objective right. standards that are the basis anymore. Now it's a particular political position and fidelity to that position alike. So how, how has polling changed over the years? Was there a particular methodology that was dominant, say, a decade ago, but now is considered outdated? Um, give us a, I'm, I'm assuming the polling is changing right along with the country uh, changes within the country as a whole. Yeah. And it's changing now, right? So it's changing from 2020 to 2022, but right. you know, that de decades ago, uh, everybody had, you know, I'll go through this quick because, because I mean, pe most people understand this, but decades ago we had Gallup, they were the gold standard, especially in presidential, uh, you know, national polling for presidential elections, Back then, the nation pretty much led states. So if you knew what was going on with the nation, then generally speaking, the state polling would follow with that national polling. And everybody had a landline. It was super easy. And, you know, not only super easy, but randomization still very much made sense because everybody was equally, uh, there was an equal likelihood, uh, you know, when you were calling randomized houses and random digital dial. Now, uh, that is, of course, not the case. People tried to evolve. Well, we'll start, we'll add cell phones. Um, you know, people used interactive voice response. You can't do that with cell phones. It's illegal. Uh, but live caller is generally right now still, unfortunately, because it's not true, Live caller interviews when you call someone on their cell phone or still landline and they're on the other line with a call center and it's a live interviewer giving this, you know, conducting this interview that is still considered the gold standard. And it's not true. Mm. It is not the case that those polls are more accurate anymore once upon a time. But it is not true anymore. So as, and there's a number of reasons for that. Some people want anonymity. I mean, there's a lot of social bias out there. Look at how you're treated if you hold certain beliefs over another, right? right. So nobody nobody wants to sit there and be uh, berated by a live caller agent, which we've, we've played recordings of this before, just to show people live agents mocking a respondent, you know, for, for choosing right. a certain response or drawing breath, like, who are you going to vote for, uh, Donald Trump or Hillary Clinton? And the respondent will say Donald Trump, and you'll hear... Ah, okay. Moving on to the next question. I mean, you can't do that, Steve, right? Uh, and then a lot of, um, we, we pioneered a lot online and then COVID hit. And when COVID hit, the panels got uber zoomy. All right. So mm -hmm. all of these professional class people who had nothing to do during the lockdown, but join up and click on, you know, click on surveys, orange man, bad, orange man, bad all day long. Uh, they screwed up the panels. So we're evolving as time goes on. And um, mixed mode is is usually the way we approach this because different people respond to different modes at different rates. So some people will be much more likely to participate in a live caller interview and they're high interest liberals. And that's fine. Uh, while a conservative may be more willing to take a survey that you text them online, right. you know, maybe to their right. cell phone. Here, take a, take a couple of minutes. Uh, so right. we we mix it up. So we make sure that groups are accurately and fairly represented because randomization, it's just not, you can't rely on it anymore. Not alone. I've heard, I've heard you mention uh, the the difficulty of polling the rural vote. Is that uh, is yeah. that still the case? It is. And we're we're polling Wisconsin, actually. Uh, and Wisconsin's a funny battleground state. It's probably the most difficult battleground state in the Rust Belt, if not across the country, to poll because unlike Pennsylvania, Michigan, even Ohio, right? And Iowa is much more rural. But two thirds of Wisconsin is rural, which is more difficult. And the polls mm -hmm. in Wisconsin have probably been the worst out of every yeah. state in the last 
uh, three cycles or so. Well, right. that's because it's just very difficult. There, first of all, it's a cult part of it's cultural. They're just like mum's the word on who I'm going to vote for. It's none of your business. You know, it's just some part of that country is like that. Um, and then, of course, reaching that raw vote. And that's why if you look in these polls all the time, it never fails, Steve. You look at the numbers. And you'll see these margins and maybe it'll show Republicans obviously are winning in the rural area, but it's not the 70 plus percent margins right. that right. actually turn out on election day. You know, you can look at it right now. National poll just came out today. It's 55, 35. Well, of course, yeah. Republicans are going right. to win more than 55 percent of the rural right. vote. And it happens right. to us, too. It does. It's right. just part of the game. Right, right. That, that Again, that's why I love having you on here, because I think you put things in such wonderful uh, perspective, objective, uh, perspective. Um, f- yeah. Forgive me for geeking out a little bit, nerding out here on you. So from Let's do and- it. Yeah. <laughs> our, our viewership is now de- descending, they're leaving, they're getting their bologna sandwiches. But from an analytical perspective, do you, do you have, um, j- take me back a little bit of how the sausage is made. Do you, do you follow a particular model in your polling? Because I noticed that you often say, like things like, you know, so-and-so doesn't know how to pull. Well, you just did it. So-and-so doesn't know how to poll Wisconsin uh, with Ron Johnson, for example. Or so-and-so has yep. no idea how to poll Ohio with J.D. Vance. They're not taking into consideration the racial or the uh, regional, I should say, uh, specificity. So um, I'm assuming you have levels of analysis, maybe like a micro Analysis at yes. the county level, meso for the state, maybe macro for the region, something like that. Uh, wh- do you use different theoretical models at different levels? We, we, we do. And even our weighting system is a little bit more uh, detailed, I would say. You know, in 16, they caught on to the education element of this. If yeah. we don't have to wait for education, uh, we won't. But at, sometimes it is necessary. And as long as you get the regional as the regional representation correctly, you'll find that you really don't maybe a very light thumb, you know, thumbprint on when it comes to waiting on education if you get region right. But they haven't yet caught up to this on region. And, you know, not to give away some of the secret sauce, but there are things that can let you know whether or not you're perhaps polling certain groups that don't represent that region fully. So, and Florida is another great example of that. Uh, Democratic support among Hispanics is constantly being overstated in Florida. And that is because they're not breaking up Hispanic groups individually like we are. We have minimum sample sizes for different states because we know it's not just about white, black, Hispanic in a state like uh, Florida. How many Cubans did we speak to? You know, from from 2019 on, there was a huge influx of Venezuelans. You know, in South Florida, how many Venezuelans did we speak to, if any? Um, They're typically loaded with more liberal Hispanic groups, like Puerto Ricans, who tend to be more willing to take surveys than some of the Mexican and more, you know, uh, quiet and reserved Cuban types. You know, Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just true. You know, we all behave differently. And that's something right. you have to recognize when we when you when you're polling. And in a place like Ohio, uh, yeah, that's another great example. It, it's incredible how many people think that uh, you know the suburbs of Cuyahoga County is an accurate representation of the working class in Eastern uh, <laughs> Ohio. I and mean, it's just crazy. Of course, that's not true. How many people in Mahoning County did you speak with, right? Or even if you don't even have to be a single county, you can lump them together. But uh, in, in Pennsylvania, I could get real nerdy here, but we we wait differently in Pennsylvania. Southeast, we separate something called Dutch country from the Southeast because, of course, Dutch country like Lancaster and York and, you know, all of these other counties are much more conservative, much more Republican than Delaware, Montgomery. So if right. you just lump them all in the Southeast, you're going to get all those high interest voters who will immediately want to participate in Delaware and Chester and you're going to miss everybody else. So right. uh, because you, sometimes you, you can't rush it. You cannot rush it. And people think I've been out there two days. I got enough numbers, but it, they don't care about where those numbers come from. And that makes all the difference. And a really lot does. of the poll, a lot of the polls that we're, we're reading that are just there for the headlines and so forth. Those are quick polls, aren't they? They take them Absolutely. 24 hours. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. This is, and, this, this and, is something that takes time to, to, to bake as it were. Yeah. It does. It, it really does. There are uh, some states that I won't even pull during, uh, you know, the early part of the week. You know, I did, everyone has different philosophies, but for me, uh, I there are certain groups that participate at higher rates at different times of day and during the week, different days mm -hmm. during the week. You know, a steel worker in Allegheny County in, in Pennsylvania, which is uh, outside of, you know, it's Pittsburgh, right? A steel worker in, you know, the working class burbs outside of Pittsburgh is not talking to you on a Monday night, ladies and gentlemen. They're not doing it. I don't care what you think you're doing. That's so special. It's not going to happen. However, on a Saturday when he's got some downtime, uh, you know, you, you poke the bear a little bit. Hey, remember me? I contacted right. you Friday night. Can you do me a favor and take five minutes to do this survey? Your, your, your opinion's important to us. Don't let others, you know, speak for you. We and the prompts are a big deal for us as well. How you go different people in taking those surveys absolutely increases or decreases response rates. And being that they're so low, you better fine tune them in order to, you, to know who you're talking about. Uh, too. Uh, so it's just, think of some of it's common sense. Steve, think really, you know, audience, think about it. Um, you know, is the union electrician going to talk to me on a Monday night after he comes home, or is he going to grab his hungry man, get in his favorite recliner and watch the game? Right, right. 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 Of course. You don't have to be an electrician to do that. <laughs> it could be a YouTube That's guy. Right. Do <laughs> a <laughs> exactly. couple of YouTube guys out there. <laughs> That's right. Or an election forecaster. I don't want to talk <laughs> to you on a Monday night either. I don't, That's right. I want to <laughs> chat with you. Leave me alone. Got a game That's on right. here. Ravens are playing. All right. Let's talk, <laughs> let's talk trends, Rich. Um, we've been talking, obviously, um, theory and so forth but now let's get in some uh some of the uh trajectories that uh, that we've yeah. been seeing of late uh, playing out in our own backyards and this is one of the reasons why i love your work i'm studying these trajectories all the time and man you just put just your analysis is just where the rubber hits the road for me um back in 2010 uh, pollster Scott Rasmussen and Doug Schoen right kind of republican democrat they published that book mad as hell um, yeah. documenting the Tea Party movement. And that is where they found some substantial data that showed a major paradigm shift taking place in, in the American electorate where the old political divides between left versus right or liberal versus conservative, Republican versus Democrat seemed to be dying away. And a new political divide was rising, and it was between, as they put it, the people versus the political class, or the rulers versus the ruled. And then a few years later in 2016, across the pond in Britain, uh, political scholars uh, Matthew Goodwin and Roger Eatwell published their book, National Populism, uh, and came to the very same conclusion with regard to the British populace in the Brexit vote, as well as they compared it with Trump's uh, election victory a few months later. Is that the trajectory that your analysis is seeing as well? Are we seeing, for lack of a better term, a paradigm shift, a new, a new partisan divide that's no longer so much Republican versus Democrat or left versus right, but it's more the, for lack of a better term, the people versus this aloof, uh, you know, what's perceived as a dismissive political class. Yeah, it, without a doubt. And uh, I think that it, it really was exacerbated over 2015 and 2016. And I think uh, part of this is natural because the more unresponsive government, be, you know, gets, then uh, it's it, it it only makes sense then that the more populist or you know national populist uh, the electorate is going to get. Like, look, you're not listening to me. Uh, you know, I'm I'm trying to air grievances here, and you've been ignoring them. This has gone on for a very long time now in this country, and eventually it was just going to boil over. You know, we're also we always ask this question of independence. People who tell us. I don't, it doesn't matter what they're registered as. People who will tell us, self-identify, that they're either an independent or there's something else, a third party, whatever it may be, we'll always ask them, well, do us a favor. Tell us which, which, more, you know, which party 
uh, are you more closely aligned with as far as your views? Would you say your views are more closely aligned with the, the Republican Party or with the Democratic Party? And even over the last year, which, you know, is relatively a short period of time, you know, in the grand scheme of how long we've seen this trend. But in the last year, the number of people who basically have chosen, I share little in common with either, has gone up about 15 mm. points. And it's mm -hmm. held there. You know, it used to be only about 10%. It would tell us, I share a little with either. The rest of them, you could lean. You know, if you really push them, who are, what are you really? Come on, stop. Everyone wants to be an independent. But, you know, you obviously lean to the right or to the left. Which way do you lean? And this very small chunk would actually not be able to lean. Now we're at a point where about a quarter just says, I share nothing with either of these parties. Wow. That's probably not legitimately true. But what it does do is illustrate their anger. Right. Yeah. With both of these people and they're they're saying I'm part of the us. They are part of the they, the them, mm -hmm. whatever you want to call it. And that really illustrates, you know, this divide that we're, that we're seeing. But this is and it's cuts across racial groups, which is something I think the media and some of these other pundits. It, it's sad because uh, it, it's really kind of dangerous. They're not acknowledging they want to make this Republican versus Democrat or a right. white versus uh, right or South versus North or whatever right. it is. Uh, and the fact of the matter is, it's not. It's an us versus them issue. Right. And if they ignore that, that's why they're losing. Uh, that's why I, I would argue Republicans are you know, gaining quite a bit of the Hispanic uh, vote that they, they would never have won otherwise. And it's frustration. Yeah, because they've, they've been tapping into that. No question that we call sure. it resentment politics. Um, and yeah. Oh, yes. Right. You know, obviously uh, from from classical Athens, they were worried about you know, mass resentment, uh, the political class was. I mean, just ask Marie Antoinette what happens when, <laughs> when mass resentment <laughs> reaches a boiling point. So so they were very so successful. True. Yeah, they were very successful in deflecting any resentment from themselves by focusing on an external enemy, you know. So uh, the uh, the Romans would be focusing on the Carthaginians or the, the Spartans yeah. would be focusing on the Athenians. So that external threat breeds internal solidarity. But there, we've got some studies that finds that since around the 1960s or so, that kind of got turned in and on itself. And the political class found that they can do the same thing. They can deflect resentment. But if they sort of divided and conquered, if they actually focused on a particular group inside uh, the society. And so now it's morphed into you know, uh, uh, Emperor Palpatine Biden and his blood red speech right. and the ultra MAGA, the most evil people. And this is what made Trump so fascinating to me, especially in 2016, but all throughout his presidency is he actually uh, it, it completely, um, uh, how do you want to say it? He, he, he bypassed all of the, what, 15, 16, the Republicans finest. We're all talking the same old neocon talking points and the like he bypassed them all and said no the problem isn't liberals the problem isn't democrats the problem is politicians politicians and so he he, right. he committed the unpardonable sin he he threw he he like laser focus resentment right back at the political class and i think that's one of the reasons why so many people love him and why so many in the uh political class despise him i've heard it i've heard I, it and that's yeah, go ahead. Oh, I was just, I was just, I was just going to say that that is too why they're willing to cause a riot in a place like Chicago because we're talking about this balkanization politics in order to divide and conquer. Well, if you have somebody like that who is, you know, I, I always say the most dangerous thing that could happen uh, to the political class is if you know BLM sits down with MAGA and they start actually right. talking about who is right. who is uh, the cause of their woes. And right. so when Donald right. Trump tries to hold a rally in Chicago, I don't you remember this, you know, they they paid for a riot that hurt four right. police officers. <laughs> right. I mean, they're like, look, we have to shut this event down <laughs> at all costs. Or, or we're Donald done. Trump yeah. Yeah, that's right. That's freaking, Donald Trump cannot out. speak to Chicago. No, that's right. Uh, that's that's right. it. It's, yeah, without that's a doubt. Right. Yeah, and that's why they're game. freaking out about Latinos as well, which we we'll get into in a in a moment, I'm sure. But um, yeah, I've I've heard it put. Trump was a third party candidate who won a major party nomination, and that's again, yes. he tapped into. 
this this populist sort of outsider sentiment that was again very uh, 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 prevalent in Brexit as well. I think it was two million people who voted uh, in 2016 for the Brexit referendum had not voted in any of the other uh, previous elections because they just had nobody to vote for. So, but so do you see Trump then as actually, if this is the case, uh, if we're seeing sort of this dealignment from the establishment parties and people feel this incredible alienation from the political class, is this why Trump is more of an asset for Republicans now? Uh, in November rather than a liability. Obviously, the political class uh, led by the media is telling us, no, he's just he's a total liability. But it seems like if these populist trajectories are happening, he would be much more of an asset, wouldn't he? Yeah, I got to tell you, I'm on the other end of this argument. There is a clear, you know, narrative uh, from the, the failed pundit class. You know, there's a failed political class. There's a failed pundit class that nice, pops, yeah. props them up. Every cycle, we have to listen to these wannabe experts and then their horrible predictions. And yet they never they never have any modesty. They never back up and say, "Yeah, Yeah. you know, I got this wrong. Maybe I'm not. uh, Don't take my word as if it's gospel. They just march on because their job is to do this. And they have clearly come to the consensus agreement that Trump is a liability. You know, we've been over this uh, with the numbers 2016, 2018, 2020, and now in 2022. Everywhere Republicans underperformed and there were, uh, you know, some good t- talking points for Democrats and the, these primary uh, elections and, and these special elections uh, this cycle leading up to November. Everywhere we saw warning signs and lower turnout was where Donald Trump was not involved. Every time Mm. Donald Trump was involved, we saw historic turnout. We saw these massive turnout numbers. Uh, And then it went in races and games he just didn't play. They underperformed. So that's clear as day. Wisconsin, Arizona, I mean, just going down the line. Uh, So I think the one thing I would be worried about if I was, uh, you know, Republicans is that the other day or a couple of weeks ago, when I first really started to talk about this, I likened it to, you know, the Republican Party is like a teenager. They just turned 18. They think they can go out on their own, but then they like flop and they have to come back home to dad. Sorry, dad, I couldn't make it. Can you support me a little longer? Right. That's Donald Trump. He's like their daddy. Right. They can't drive some of these voters to the polls without him. They can't right. do it because there are too many. And we, we, we've been saying this since the end of 2020, the election, that uh, you know, there's a real potential here. Republicans lose a lot of these Trump voters who are, and you were just talking about Brexit, there are a lot of new people Donald Trump brought into the political process. They just did, didn't care before. They didn't think that their vote made a difference. They thought the world would just go on with or without them. And there was really, they had no voice and there was nothing they could do about it. Republicans were not, just assured those votes and without him around i'm not sure they'll get them uh you know in 18 they argued he was a liability his approval rating was so low in truth the only reason the republicans maintained control of the u.s senate in 2018 was because of him he single-handedly ran around the country and rallied for the candidates who couldn't get over the finish line otherwise we might have seen states like indiana not fall well you know and, and on and on Right. And there's numerous examples there. He saved that uh, that that majority, and uh, I, I dare I say he's going to have to win it in November. Mm, yeah, so I, I noticed that you were talking about his poll numbers are consistently higher than several of the candidates, right? In some yeah. of the states, so like yeah. in uh, Pennsylvania, for example. Yes, never found. We have never found at any. It's going looking all through the history of us polling the state of Pennsylvania, never found a presidential candidate outside of the sampling era. Meaning, if they had a lead, it was always, you know, Trump's up by two, Biden's up by two. The biggest lead we ever saw in Pennsylvania was for Hillary Clinton, when it was nearly almost four points, but still really within the sampling era, which was 3.7 for that for that survey. So that was the biggest lead we had ever found for any candidate until that poll in Pennsylvania, uh, what, about two weeks ago now. Donald mm-hmm. Trump had a almost seven-point lead on Joe Biden, which 
It, we polled it all through 2020. It was always a fairly cr- close race. This is not a close race anymore. This right. is just, it's an early call. It's right. an early call race. When, when a Republican candidate is getting 45% in Allegheny County, it's over. It's over. It's done. Yeah. It's yeah. over. Right. So, uh, and then, you know, you had Doug Mastriano in a tight race with Shapiro, but no, not performing anywhere near the levels Donald Trump was performing. And then Oz, of course, you know, so he's going to, he's going to have to help these candidates over the finish line. It's not a dog on them. It's just that there are certain people, certain voters who will do anything to vote for Donald Trump. But no matter what, you know, the Republicans still have not been able to establish themselves as Trump's brand. He's still held up here, you know, and they're still down here in the politician area. Right. Right. They're in the scrum for politicians. And he's up here where people are like, yeah, he's a Republican, but he's. You know, he's different. It's Trump. It's Trump. It's, Trump. it's exactly. totally different with him. It's right? an outsider. They're not, it's there not yet. part of the political class. Yep. That's right. Yep. That's right. Yep. Totally different. So what are, what are some of the groups that we're seeing? You mentioned the education disparity or uh, discrepancy, I should say. Um, uh, college grad, non-college grad. It seems like that's becoming very partisanized. You mentioned Latinos. Uh, I've read black men are are increasingly, as opposed to black women are still 95% Democrat. Black men are much more likely to uh, look at this uh, and be very attractive to this populist movement. What are some of the more notable demographics you're seeing shifting yeah, in this and paradigm? Shift? Especially among black voters and black men, um, the younger, the less attached they are to the Democratic Party. So mm. men who are especially working men who are, you know, basically 45 and below, uh, they they are they just don't have the, that long term ancestral connection to the Democratic Party that their mothers and fathers and grandparents still have or feel like they have. Um, they they have no real loyalty to that party, so that that's certainly changing. I would even say that four year degree, uh, because we do break down education. Uh, well, we break it down even more than this, but uh, we regroup them later. High school less, right or less, so they may have a GED or they have secondary mm-hmm. school or something like that. Uh, from there, it's some college or associate's degree. That is getting to be a fantastic group for Republicans. That four-year degree was much, first of all, it pulls well for, it pulls better than for Democrats than it performs on election day. So in the end, it, it is interesting. And we, we always heard about the, you know, the college educated voter uh, with Donald Trump. But the truth is, it was really that advanced degree. You know, where we saw big margins, 70-30, 75-25 against Republicans and against Trump. In the four-year college degree, uh, that category right now has really soured on Joe Biden. So I I think that we're to a point where Republicans have chipped away at that quite a bit, which is why we've seen some bigger leads for Donald Trump in national polls, uh, whereas before 2020, leading up into that election— he routinely trailed, albeit by a few points. The question was whether or not he could win the Electoral College. It was ne- right. never when, whether or not he was going to lead a national poll, right? And, right? and two years ago, I would have argued that Republicans are not going to win the popular vote for probably quite a while. But mm-hmm. this realignment has changed the map and it's changed the equation. When you have that many working class Hispanics shifting over and voting for you, when you see 30 point swings in the largest growing voting group in the country. Because remember folks, white educated voting blocks, they're not growing. They're not demographically the future of the country. The census just came out. It's all working Hispanic. So whoever dominates that party is going to have the, you know, the more rock solid coalition. And that can change whether or not a party or a candidate can win the popular vote. So I'm, I'm telling you, two, two years, three years ago, if you would have said, Rich, Donald Trump's going to routinely be leading on the, uh, you know, in a national poll, and it's highly likely to carry the popular vote, I'd say, you're out of your mind. It's not going to happen. But it's because of the realignment within these groups. Uh, Asians are getting more democratic, uh, you know, but there are some of those higher income, more educated white voters who went for Joe Biden, who went for Democrats, who now are... Uh, I, you know, I don't know how to put it, but buyers you know, remorse. <laughs> buyers rem- everyone has to go to the grocery store at some point, right? And yeah. that's what they see. So right. after when you hit people in their own wallets, Steve, it's like, 
so much for yeah. that ideology. Completely. Yeah, it's you a know? double entendre. Buyer's remorse for the broccoli as well as for Biden uh, when they voted for him. It's, uh, you, That's right. You're... And student loan forgiveness. They're not mad because it's unfair. You know, this is a funny thing about those four year degree, uh, you know, more educated, uh, higher income people. They're not mad that student loan forgiveness is unfair to people who never even went to college and will have to pay that bill. No, right. they went to college. They paid their student loans and they don't feel like they should have to pay anybody else's. So yes. it's a double edged sword that that uh, student loan forgiveness. It was very. Risky. Oh, my heavens. And yeah. I think it's going to tick those people off. Yeah, there's far more there's far more blowback than there is blessing, I think, uh, with that. It seems without so a doubt. Weird. Yeah. 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 Well, how much how much of this uh, played into your tracking of the Virginia election with Glenn Youngkin and Terry McAuliffe? Because you really nailed that. I was I was I was stunned at the precision of you. Um you know, with Youngkin, he just won by a couple of percentage points, but it required just some serious dominance in virtually all the counties. You called it. You saw it. Um, I, we saw uh, what one exit poll had 75 percent of white women without college degrees voting for Youngkin, which is crazy because traditionally, you know, the blue, the white blue yeah. collar vote is the labor vote. It's the it's the FDR vote. Um, how much of this uh, did you what factored into your your analysis of that election? Well, you have to believe them, right? So when mm. the, those working class people, especially in the, they call it the mountain region and whatever, the Shenandoah Valley area, you know, all of the other pollsters that I was looking at, you know, looking at how much they were waiting for these groups, um, you know, they, they underrepresented them, but they also, I think, to some degree, didn't believe the margins that they were telling them. And I learned that lesson in Ohio in 2016. I had, you know, these, these, like you said, typical, those are Democratic voters. I know they voted yeah. for Barack Obama twice. Yeah. And in, right. you know, the yeah. Appalachia area of, of Ohio, which kind of looks a little bit like, you know, that, that part of Pennsylvania going into West, right. I mean, uh, part of Virginia going to West Virginia. Uh, they were telling us uh, in big margins, I simply didn't believe them. So we waited them. Uh, we waited the representation down a little bit. So that's how you, you know, that's how you blow. That's how you get a Trump plus five, not a Trump plus eight. Right. right. Um, right. Ex with Yunkin, I got to be, you know, in all humility here. It, it's not only the margin, it was the electorate that we were so proud of with that polling. Right. We projected right. that electorate perfectly down to ideology, down to region. Right. And sometimes you even do it, you shock yourself. And that's one of those where I was uh, I, uh, even shocked myself. Party identification was spot on, ideology, age was spot on. Uh, and, and that's, again, I think that sometimes a pollster has to listen. And if you oh, uh, these these overly aggressive waiting techniques violate a, a, a part of this philosophy that I have, which is if you tell the electorate what you think it's going to look like, then you're you're imposing your own bias. This is what right. I want to happen. Right. You have right. to learn how to listen to them. They'll tell you what it's going to look like, but you have to believe them, you know, to some measurable degree. Right. And that's why right. we don't like to wait for party. Because it, right. one exit poll to another, folks, party ID is never the same, not nationally, not in any state. So how would you know how many more Democrats one year than Republicans are going to vote this time if you don't, if you wait for party? If you do wait right. for party, then you're going to, you're, you're imposing your own belief um, on what you think is going to happen. And that's, uh, to me, it's a big no-no. It always has been. If you do everything else right, region, gender, age, Right. Uh, mm -hmm. then, then you should be fine and, and the rest will work itself out, right? It, it, it's, I don't want to get too much in the weeds, but every time you wait for one variable, it throws another one out of alignment. Right. So Interesting. Yeah. let it is what right. I'm saying. Let right. it. So if you, right. if you think it looks too Republican, it's not up to you. If you think it looks too Democratic, it's not up to you. Are the other core variables right? And do you feel right. confident that you represent it? And all you're seeing there is that, you know, today at this given time and this given election cycle, there are more people who are identifying as Republican than usual in the state of Virginia. That's what happened. And so we believed them. And that's what that's why we, you know, Suffolk did not believe them. The Monmouth poll didn't believe them. They imposed their own weights on them. And we yep. just shut up and listen. That's the difference. Yeah. I looked up the uh, 
the polls, uh, this, I notice you do this a lot too, especially with the Senate, um, which apparently is just such abysmal polling uh, historically. Ugh, <laughs> I, know, I knew I knew I'd get you with that one. It's like, ah, just don't even awful. do Senate polls. Anymore. But I, I looked up Yunkin uh, McAuliffe, um, well, yeah, September, September uh, 2021. McAuliffe in some of these polls was up 10 points, looked like it was going oh, yeah. to blow out, you know, and, <laughs> and, and, uh, and here we are, right. It's just, uh, you got to watch out. So, so, so talk, uh, talk to the audience a bit about the cyclical nature of polling, the seasonal nature of polling. Yeah. Uh, are we, or are we slowly getting out of, I should say a historical or a, a, uh, a cyclical lull for uh for republican voting the republicans seem to vote uh sorry polling republicans seem to poll uh rather um low in uh say july and august is that yes. correct yeah there are two times during the year two periods during the year where i think uh you know it's pretty obvious and and people look this is what bothers me the most this is what's so dis this is the dishonest part yeah. of polling yeah everybody yeah. knows it's knows there it. Yeah. Everyone yeah. knows there's a summer and response yet, bias that hurts Republicans. And they yet they it. exploit it. You they know, and then by the way, the yeah. that's that's the problem, Steve. So there really are two problems with this industry. One is methodological and we know it. They know it. The other one isn't methodological. It's ethical because right. they know those methodological problems are, are there. Those challenges are there, but they're exploiting it. They know they could do things to to address and fix them. They don't want to. They want to have ridiculous leads for Democrats going into Labor Day. Uh, then right. that's typically just to tell, you know, to give the audience answer to the question. Um, Labor Day is typically, you know, that threshold where we see a pivot. Everyone is starting school again. Once that happens, kids are back at school. Everyone's in their routine. By the way, it may not shock people. It may. Republicans tend to be parents more than Democrats. <laughs> they work more. I'm right. sorry. It's just true. Right. Uh, it you know, true. Yeah, people... Yeah. I always get angry messages when I say that, but it's reality. We have Go the look data the on it. We, right. we have the data. Eric Kaufman <laughs> of the University of London. He has a 300-page book on it. There, there's no way around Huge. it. Huge. No, yeah. There's no way around it. Uh, yeah. And then, you know, the part of this, what I what I think we're seeing now, though, is that, yes, we... I, 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 I am convinced Marquette only put out that one point lead for Johnson yesterday because we'd been beating them like a drum and because they know we're in the field in Wisconsin. So they did not want to come out with a with a, um, you know, a, a poll that showed uh, Johnson down by 10, which is their normal. If you go look at their September polling in the state of Wisconsin since 2016, they had Hillary Clinton double digit leads. Yeah. They had Russ Feingold double digit leads. They had uh, a Avers, who, who is running well ran yeah. against walker now or, Bi or Biden. Himself. remember with biden, biden. They had like a 14 point lead for the crazy. Crazy. in wisconsin abc right? news and yeah. abc news basically confirmed it with a 17 point lead so you know i mean it looked <laughs> this is folks this is outrageous nobody's yeah. gonna win the state of wisconsin by 17 points but no, um no. they put that johnson out there i think because they knew we were coming with results soon they didn't want to look stupid That's cool. all right but yeah. typically at this point, we move to likely voters, and they're not doing that right now. Like AP put right. out a poll today of adults. Uh, the YouGov <laughs> polls are all registered voters. They're all doing this on yeah. purpose. They're doing right. it on purpose. Yes. Right. Right. That's This should be all likely voter at this point. And part right. of your job as a pollster is to predict the electorate. That's right. part of your job. 80% right. of it. Right, as as a, as opposed to try to uh, to push the electorate in a particular direction, as a, which that's I'm right. trying to do, push polls, as we say. So, what is yeah. what is your assessment of this so-called uh, possibility of a blue tide uh, <laughs> uh, forming here? <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I, didn't mean I to gotta laugh, ask this question because there's tons of people watching so right now. We're like, I'm so scared. I'm so scared. There's a blue this tide is... on the horizon. There are other things uh, in the election forecast modeling, the real modeling, not the fake models you see on online all the time, uh, academic modeling. There are several things that are predictive that are non-polling variables, right? right. All of them uh, suggest that it'll be a typical first term incumbent midterm, maybe a little bit worse for Democrats. And if I say typical, what do I mean? Yeah, people as unpopular as Harry Truman could have even worse midterms. 
But even popular first term incumbent presidents have had bad midterms where they lost the House. They lost two to four seats in the Senate. It happens. Barack Obama was at 46, 47 percent when he lost 63 seats in the House right. of Representatives and, yeah. and uh, yeah, and six seats in the U.S. Senate. So all Republicans need this year is a net gain of two in the Senate. Yeah. They're going to get it. You know, our modeling that we put out yesterday ev- and the reason why we're so comfortable, those other variables that are have been more predictive than polling, they all suggest everything except for Arizona at this point is going to go to the GOP outside of, you know, New Hampshire would still lean Democrat at this point, but right. it could not. I mean, and there we could get to a point where uh, New Hampshire goes as well. But, right. you know, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, all these states that, you know, people have these delusions about, uh, those are going to go to the GOP. Uh, that's just what history suggests. And also, I pulled uh, these races myself. They are not the races that uh, the media is portraying them to be. And all of the polling errors we've been discussing in every state except for Arizona and New Hampshire are uh, those polling errors, those average errors right now uh, within that margin that you would if if passed as prologue and the polls are as wrong as they have been, Republicans will take those seats. Wow. So can you give us a rich just like a quick kind of rundown of what you see as the state of play. Um, yeah, yeah, I mean, sure. amazing stuff's going on in Arizona right now, Nevada. I mean, Pennsylvania, my backyard with Mastriano, um, uh, Georgia, Herschel Walker. Give us, a, give us a little play-by-play here. Yeah, let's start in Georgia, where I know Republicans, because of the response bias that we did see, and the Quinnipiac polls, uh, Warnock plus 10, Uh, You know, this lunacy, lunacy. Um, Yeah, Georgia at this point spending all this money against Herschel Walker. Warnock cannot put him away. He will Mm. lose. Warnock will lose and Herschel Walker will win that race. I mean, it it is uh, at this point, all of that money and Herschel Walker barely had enough to get the tour bus around the state. And he's still ahead in every poll except for Quinnipiac, which is one of the worst polls out there. Let's be real. It is. It didn't. In the last three election cycles, it didn't predict the core battleground states correctly at all. In many cases, they didn't predict one race cor- correctly. So, uh, you know, it, they just har- they have a horrible track record. Uh, but Walker, you know, in the ones that you know have a decent track record, is just pulling between. In our polling, it was two points on the low, five points on the high. I had to go back and look to make sure I had that correct. But he uh, and we're moving into the the football season here, which. People, again, this is why I say part science, part art. Have you ever been to the state of Georgia, folks? Have you ever gone to Athens during football season, right? I mean, this is this is going to, you know, buoy Herschel Walker as time goes on. The surprise for me is Adam Laxalt in Nevada. Um, He is one of the smartest cookies, or at least his campaigns have been for Republicans this cycle. He decided finally to abandon the idea that Republicans are going to win back Washoe County, not abandon it, not abandon it, but just not make it its his core and central focus. Instead, he pivoted toward the data, you know, what the data suggested he do. I see working class Hispanics moving toward Republicans. I'm going to Clark County where it represents 70% of the vote anyway, and I'm going to beat it like a drum in Clark wow. County. And he's doing it. So when wow. you have uh, the incumbent at 40%, and like she was in the Emerson poll, and 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 him up, uh, also Trafalgar had him up, we're going into Nevada soon ourselves, which is surprising to me. Uh, when you see that, you have to give it to Laxalt that he is going to win uh, that race. Wow. Otherwise, again, that's, that's the spending huge. Dispute, it's huge. That's huge. huge. I mean, Nevada, Nevada hasn't been pink. I mean, it's or purple rather. It's been it's been blue. That's right. Like how many election cycles now? That's amazing. And think about this: that Nevada is more likely to go Republican than New Hampshire first. Right. So New right. Hampshire being eighty three percent white, folks, eighty three right. plus actually percent white. Uh, it still hasn't, you know, shown the movement that Nevada has toward Republicans. Why is that? Again, that realignment that we're talking about, those working class Hispanics that are the heart of that vote, Democrats have been relying on in those states for years. Without that, they cannot win. Um, and, and I think Laxalt, who has made a huge effort, I can't, I really can't overstate this. Uh, his, 
outreach part of his campaign has just been tremendous. Awesome. Uh, and, and, you know, good for him, you know, and again, that moves us into that, you know, so after those two, where does that take us to so the Rust Belt States where we really have to consider that, you know, uh, Ron Johnson has never led and, <laughs> and he, right. he wins, he wins comfortably by four yeah. points, you know? So we just have to give it to Ron Johnson that he, he's very popular in that wow area in southeastern Wisconsin, which you need to be for a Republican. You've got to do well there in like Racine and Kenosha, right? Waukesha outside of those areas. You have to do well there, but you also have to be super popular as you run up to the Northwest because uh, Ashland and Bay counties were like the heart of the labor movement. They still have a lot of Democratic votes up there. So you really have to run through the more conservative areas and then right up to Ashland and Bay and not get murdered there by huge margins. That's the that's the recipe to win Wisconsin. And he is, you know, he's got that. He's got the love all the way in the rural areas. And he, yeah. he you know, he's got the love and wow, he, it's going to be incredibly difficult to beat. So right. we give we give Wisconsin a run as well. Awesome. And what was the, the other one was Pennsylvania, right? At Mastriana. Yeah, Pennsylvania and Arizona, yeah. I think was the other one too. Arizona is the only one right now out of the ones that, you know, you would think it's an easy state uh, Republic, for Republicans should be able to swing it in a good Republican year. The money, the spending disparity there has been huge against, uh, well, in favor of Kelly against Masters. Now right. that Masters is beginning to spend some money, I, I we're, we'll retool that again, but we still had that one leans Democrat. The governor's race, however, which is, you know, the joke of some of these other models moving the governor's race to leans Democrat today. It just happened, even though there's no polling to suggest that uh, Katie Hobbs is ahead. It's ludicrous. <laughs> Carrie Lake is an odds on favorite to win that uh, gubernatorial election. I pulled it myself uh, and others. We were just it, it's funny because. There was just an article in Politico exposing this, even though it wasn't as deep as some of the conversations we've had. Even the Democratic operatives in Arizona know Katie Hobbs is down. Right. And the, the McCain, right. Trump-hating wing of the Republican Party yeah. knows that Katie Hobbs is down. It seems like the only one who doesn't is the fake polling, the fake polling uh, experts and uh, the, the forecasting gurus out there. Uh, right. Everyone else in Arizona knows Hobbs is a flawed candidate, is not performing well. And because of Carrie Lake's history with the media, she has been uh, smooth. Yeah. Run, she's what, running, what do you, uh, she's can I ask, what do, you think, what do you think her chances are with the Latina vote out there? I wouldn't be surprised if Carrie Lake wins the Hispanic vote in Arizona. A couple points, wow. not huge, yeah. but I wouldn't yeah. be surprised if she oh. eeks it out by two to five points. I really would. I wouldn't. mean, if. If she lost it 45, 55, that would be astonishing. Yeah, historically speaking. I mean, if you're getting to that kind of parody and just, I mean, that's amazing. Yep. That's incredible. We had her down about four with Hispanics and an internal wow. poll, which was for a Democratic group, had wow. her up, for, with, had her winning the Hispanic vote with 51%. That's and that's by the, the way, Hobbs, they, they had down, they had down uh, three points. So again, all of the Democratic strategists know she's down. Yet, uh, you know the 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 election forecast gurus oh, must know gosh. something we don't know. They don't know anything. They had <laughs> Florida blue. They had Texas blue. They had North Carolina blue. They just every state is blue. Every state, <laughs> amazing, <laughs> amazing. They're a, bunch, they're a bunch of Smurfs. That's what they are. They're just throwing blue. I did Smurfs. <laughs> It's like a Jackson right. Pollock with one color. You know? <laughs> Justin Pollock with one color. I love it. That's great. All right. Tell That's me it. about Pennsylvania. Yeah. Pen Pennsylvania, we did have uh, Mastriano down by less than one point. And then we had uh, Fetterman still up by about less than four. It was 3.8. Uh, but there are things that uh, there are two things I want to bring up about this. One, the media is polling a race that doesn't exist. When there are significant numbers of third party candidates on ballots, you have mm. to add them to your poll. If you don't, mm. you will get an incorrect response. There's a Keystone uh, party uh, candidate in both races. There's a Libertarian candidate party in both races, Green Party. And in one, there are two, not one, but two listed as independents. Pennsylvania has a very long history of significant third party vote. So right. uh, if you're not polling that race, 
then you're not mimicking the ballot and you will not have an accurate result. That's that's one thing I just want to bring up. And then two was in both the Senate and the gubernatorial election, the number of the percentage, I should say, of people who were undecided but disapproved of Joe Biden was enormous. And and in both cases, it was heavily, heavily weighted towards strongly disapproved. So if 68% strongly disapproved, 60 or 68% disapproved, strongly was at 60. And the same thing was also true in Arizona too. So while we had masters down by three, uh, you know, seven and 10. So all of right, the undecideds right. across the country don't like Joe Biden. Which way yeah. do you think they're going to vote? You think they're going to vote that's, for John Fetterman? Come on. Right. That's where they- For the uh, first time ever. Yeah. In history? Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> that's where the happen. presidential approval really kicks in, doesn't it? Right track, it wrong track, and presidential approval. You talk about those two very, uh, very clear indicators there. How about, how about, um, uh, how about Ohio uh, and J.D. Vance? You know- uh, I don't mean to, you know, pick I, when, when I cite a poll and, you know, I, I'm not like doing it just for the sole purpose of criticizing them. This idea that some of these pollsters like Suffolk who did, you know, because they're they're USA Today's pollster and that local paper they did that poll for is owned by USA Today. There's some, you know, a, a, a child company. They haven't polled the state of Ohio correctly in 10 years. Right. 10 years it's been since they've gotten an accurate result. They had Richard Cordray beating Mike DeWine by seven points. That's a 12-point miss, over 12-point miss. Mike DeWine comfortably won that election by five points. They had Donald Trump going down to Hillary Clinton by uh, five, I believe it was. Oh, Trump, of course, won that by eight. I mean, so, yeah. you know, over and over and over, Vance is not going to lose that race. Right. I. I was talking with a Bloomberg, uh, a reporter from Bloomberg the other day. He's from Mahoning County originally. And he's like laughing and starting like this is off the record. And this certainly isn't going in the article, but I'm from Ohio. These <laughs> polls are full of crap, aren't they? He says, there's no way Tim Ryan can win this state uh, against J.D. Vance. Just no way. And it said, not only will Tim Ryan get beaten like a drum in his own backyard, because he will. Tim Ryan still represents part of Mahoney, Right. Uh, right. Vance is going to crush him, watch, in his own backyard. And then right. Vance is going to run ahead of the curve in the suburbs of Cincinnati. Mark yeah. my words, it will happen, and Vance will win by a comfortable margin. These yeah, polls are just outrageous. It's a comparable thing as well, I think. just uh, I don't see Iowa or Ohio as purple anymore. They are so solid red at this point. It's uh, because of this paradigm shift, because of the, all those counties, right. Wisconsin, Iowa, Michigan, Pennsylvania, that voted – for every Democratic president since the 1980s, just that massive shift. Hillary never saw it coming um, and voting for Trump. I came across a stat, uh, Rich, uh, that even if Hillary had gotten the same number of the black vote that Obama did, she still would have lost because she lost whites, white working class voters to that extent. It was that kind of slaughter. Yeah, absolutely yeah, stunning. Woods, Woods County, Trumbo County, all of these uh, that you were just men- mentioning, um, it wouldn't really have mattered what uh, Hillary did because a lot of things, something that people overlook is that Obama did a lot better with those white working class voters right. than, than polling suggested he would do, or even I would argue exit polls show that he did. He clearly right. did because you can't win Trumbull. You can't win Woods unless you do well with these voters. There just aren't enough black voters in those counties. Mahoney County, right. Tim Ryan's backyard. Obama won those and Trump thrashed her and Biden right. in these right. areas. I mean, right. thrashed. So right. we, we uh, sometimes overlook that these very same voters who, by the way, they hate now, and, uh, you know, right. Don, as Joe Biden calls them a threat to uh, yeah. our existence. Well, they lost them. Uh, they lost them. That's why. Yeah. <laughs> that, right. Right. I mean, they were Obama voters, ladies and gentlemen. They voted for Barack Obama. We can't, you know, twice, not once. Twice. Yeah. Two twice. times. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yes. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. you know, it's, let's get let's put it all into context or, here. Or, or, or we forget that Iowa voted for Dukakis, for heaven's sakes. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> so did Wisconsin. <laughs> You yeah, know? yeah. I mean, this is right, right. I mean, just this the shift is real, and it's, uh, yeah. it's, it's, it's glorious. It's absolutely amazing shift happening here. So the big question, the finale from your vantage yeah. point, seven weeks away. What do you see in terms of pickups in the House and Senate? In the What's Senate, the it's uh, 
In the Senate right now, we're at 52-48 uh, for Republicans. They'll take it uh, with 52 seats. That could climb if what typically happens in the fall happens. Uh, that inflation number, it was a nightmare for Democrats. Let's get real. Right. That that right. They needed that number to, to ease, and it did not. So I think that's the end of Joe Biden's rebound in approval rating because inflation has been driving disapproval this whole time. Uh, not Afghanistan, inflation. And, you know, people having to pay more at the grocery store and at the gas pump and, by the way, for their own homes. So that'll be the end of that. Uh, we had a summer of kind of feel good. The economy may be doing better. The jobs market may be doing better. Inflation may be going down. That's over now. Reality is hit. So if that is the case, uh, then that puts, again, uh, Arizona and potentially New Hampshire in play. If they really get wiped off the map, they could pick up 54. Oh, uh, you know, then you look at O'Day in Colorado. The reason why Colorado is blue is because of younger voters. Well, the last time we had a midterm that was a favorable midterm to Republicans, Cory Gardner won because those young voters did not come out in droves the way that Democrats need them to. And they typically do in a presidential cycle. But we're not there yet. You know, I, I would say the next one to go would be Arizona, which would put him at 53. But right now we're at 52 uh, for Republicans. And in the House, this should be the year that Republicans break their cap of 247. And if you go back, I, I went over this uh, the other day in a, in, a, in a presentation. They have a historical ceiling of 247 seats in, as a majority. And going back and looking at all the different presidential approval ratings and what that president uh, had lost during a first term incumbent midterm, ending with the size of the Republican majority, in the best Republican majority years, we're right in that area with presidential approval rating and economic numbers where we should see Republicans break that 247. Unfortunately, I think we have an historic first year where Republican leadership really doesn't want to win that big. They don't. Right. So right. they're not helped. They don't. They do not want MAGA running around the halls of Congress. They don't. Right. So right. he doesn't want to be, uh, and by he, I mean Kevin McCarthy, he yeah. does not want to be Baynard. He remembers right. what happened to John Boehner when the Tea Party movement uh, came in. So right now, I still, though, still would be stunned if Republicans were not 240 or north of 240. It would, because something that happens, whether the pollsters like it, whether the fake polls like it, whether the faux election gurus like it, and whether Mitch McConnell or Kevin McCarthy or Chuck Schumer and Nancy, Nancy Pelosi like, this is history. Right. And the voters do what they do, whether you like it or not. And there are always, especially in first-term incumbent midterms, meaning it is the first midterm for a first new president, they tend to lose. And how unpopular they are dictates most of the time, and so does the map, how badly they lose. This is suggesting that uh, Democrats are in for it. They're in wow. for it. And, you know, I, I would be stunned, Steve, if at the end of the night, we weren't sitting there going, wow. Who is even talking about that seat? It always happens. There are right. always surprises. Right. There's always you know? surprises. Isn't there? yeah. And there's yeah. nothing you can do about it. Republicans thought in 18, well, the president's not that unpopular and the economy's roaring, right? And we have a tax cut we could talk about. And people really believed that was going to work. And I just sat there the whole time. Nope. It's a first term incumbent midterm. Where yeah. you're gonna get we're 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 looking at heavy losses here. And people right. thought I was like being a doomer. It's history. I'm it's not being history. a doomer. There's a pattern. It's cyclical. It's a pattern. Yeah, it's cyclical. Yeah. It's like a pen. Think of it as a pendulum. And, yeah. uh, you yeah. know, that's the way American politics is. And people don't, they love to have checks too on the current president. You know, that, that, that core, that's still it's smaller than it used to be. But that middle who decides elections, they, is, if they don't like the president, they'll want to check it. And that's why you'll see a Senate majority leader in the state of New Jersey lose to a guy who spent $90 on donuts. Think about hey, it Derek. for a second, guys. Hey, <laughs> He's the best, man. I, He's the best. You got, he's an American icon. He's an American he hero. If guy. I had another he child, really I would have named him after him. I'm telling you. <laughs> <laughs> That's excellent. But this is what, you know, the, the voters tend to do what they want to do. And history and reality always win. You know, I mean, they, yeah. they they thought they could stop it with tax cuts. It couldn't happen. Right. Democrats right. don't even really have anything that they could talk of. They don't. Everything they've done is yeah. largely unpopular. 
Uh, they can talk about student loans, but then you risk pissing all four year college degrees exactly. in the suburbs. Part of my French, right. you know, so right. Uh, right. they're in a bad spot. History tells right. us this or or like uh, Kamala damned. or Kamala the other day. Well, the border's th- thoroughly secure. We're all, we're all fine. Uh, Even liberals are going, Kamala, come on. What? Now you're going to put it on the front burner again <laughs> as an issue. Shut up. Be quiet. <laughs> that's right. And that's why it, it is smart for Republican governors uh, to be dumping. You know, yep. uh, uh, yep. these waves of uh, of, uh, you know, illegals into liberal areas. But yep. this is what I would personally do. And I've been actually t- telling people this. I would take some of them and those four year college degrees that we're talking about that are in battleground districts. I would take, uh, you know, bus a, a bus or two and I would dump them right in the, this like, you know, the, the shopping mall or the strip mall of their favorite restaurants. You know, they're That's like right. a little right. mid to upper crust uh, restaurants. You know, I would put them right in the parking lot, see how they like it. Right. Yeah. Maybe in front of a Starbucks right next to their favorite hair salon. Right. That's what I would do. Yeah. The problem is yours now because <laughs> people have to be made to live with the pain of the policies yeah. that they support. Exactly. Otherwise, they live in a bubble. And the only way to, to, to get them to pay attention is to that bubble. You got to do it. Got to Turn every it. town into a border town. That's the only way. You That's on. right. Wow. Rich Barris. It's so cool, uh, guys. What Rich and I were talking before uh, before the video here. And I'm like, so, Rich, how much time do you have? And he's like, ah, half an hour. I said, all right, good. I think we just went an hour, Rich. I uh, felt it, was, <laughs> it, was, it was too oh, fast well. for me, man. I couldn't help it. It was great. I have wanted to oh, chat well. with you for so long. Uh, you've been so kind to give us so much of your time. We'll have links down below uh, for all of you guys to go and subscribe to Rich's work. Anything you want to highlight, Rich? I know you're on YouTube. you got a locals platform. Anything else that you want to highlight? Yeah, the, the best place to follow me, uh, you know, people can join on Rumble. I'm on Twitter, Getter, Truth, right? But the, the best place to follow me is definitely on uh, Locals, peoplespundit.locals.com. And from there, they can check out the public polling project. We're always looking for uh, people to help us get that, share it far and wide. It's the only su- is successful anyway. Other people have tried it, but it, it just didn't last. It didn't work. Ours is the only successful publicly funded uh, long-term project where we, we you know, the... the I don't have media influence uh, or corporate influence at, at all. The, the public funds the poll, and I just have to make sure I'm doing the best job I can do. Uh, so, you know, but they can follow all that on Locals and check out what we're doing. Um, even if they don't become a supporter, becoming a member, you at least, follow, you know, stay stay up to date on what we're doing. And you'll know when polls are coming out. Wisconsin and Nevada will be coming up soon. So they wouldn't want to miss that. It's Yeah, it's going to be two big ones. I'm telling you, Marquette Cave. They caved. They were going to drop. <laughs> they were going to put. They were going to drop a poll that showed, uh, you know, Johnson down by five or something. Oh, but I, I hammered them and told them we're, you know, we're, we're in the field. Don't, don't do it because I will shame be, you. Were they supposed I'll to do be a the whole gold video standard on. at one point or something? Uh, Marquette. <laughs> they, yeah, they. Once upon a time, people used to call Marquette University the gold standard. Honestly, it was always a little bit overblown. They were able to call the recall race the very first one against Scott Walker. They did that correctly. Um, and then, you know, Walker had been challenged multiple times. They kept getting more and more democratic as time went on. They were never really particularly good at the presidential level. Uh, it, truth be told, it was kind of like a, a um, you know, like a, a mythology that really was never merit based. And, right. you know, it's just, just true. And that right. over time, it's gotten even worse. Uh, in 2020, right. they started to release maps showing where they spoke to people like we do. And it was very obvious what their problem was. And they took that off the board and haven't done it since, since they got <laughs> criticism for it. You know, right. like, yeah, like the $30,000 a year in Milwaukee is not working class. Okay. Like right. that, that's not a traditional working class voter. Right. All right. Right. You probably pulled a student or something in, right. you know, <laughs> right. It's right. Cra- crazy, crazy. Right. But yeah, yeah they're, I would they're... argue they never were. Yeah, revealing their regional biases, their class biases. That's right. Uh, That's right. Rich Barris, my friend, you are amazing, dude. I can't thank you enough for your work. I love your Twitter feed, by the way, as well. Guys, you want to check that out. <laughs> uh, it means so spicy. much. Yeah, well, so you got to be spicy, man. You, you're, you're in the thick of things. 
Um, <laughs> we got to do this again, man. I'm serious. I'm going to put you on the spot here, particularly if we if I know you're going to be super busy the closer we get to the elections. But if you got a little slot for me, I would so appreciate it. I know you're going to be in much in demand, but I, I oh, we'll make it we happen. Get... Oh, man, I'll be we'll great. make I'd it happen. To have Absolutely. That's awesome. Rich this was Ferris, good. An guys, hour went the... real quick. Yeah, no, this is great. I mean, this is uh, like I said, I've wanted to talk to you forever. And so this is this is a little gift for me that I get to share with the audience, as it were. So Rich Ferris, a polling virtuoso like no other. God bless you, man. So appreciate it. All, all the best. Thanks for having me, Steve. All the best. You bet. Thank you.